everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Dr. Music Podcast, where I have with me today Miss Lee Aaron. She is a singer and Ontario, Canada native that has had platinum records, multiple top 40 hits, 10 Juno Award nominations, uh, toured around the world, worked with the biggest names in the industry. Lee Aaron is set to release Elevate. The follow-up to last year's Radio On record, and it comes out November 25th on Metalville Records. Lee, Aaron, thank you so much for taking time. Super happy to be here. <laughs> That's You know, when I first found you, Metal Queen, uh, I remember the record well. Looking through, and you know, we have this warrior princess with a sword, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yes completely i'm sold you know it was in the it was in the cart right away um how's that feel when you when you think about that time is that a is is that a dark time for you or is that something you look back fondly on um you know i think like with every uh chapter of your life there are positive and negative aspects to it i mean just virtue of youth itself there's great things about being young um you know you have your health and your energy and your vibrancy and then there's the things about being young is that you're stupid <laughs> usually <laughs> and you often make you know you know questionable choices because you just don't have the life experience yet right so right. um yeah like in terms of were we having fun oh man like yeah it was a great time in my life Good. Um, writing that record, being part of that whole rock movement, which was in the early 80s kind of an underground movement, and especially being a woman in that genre of music. I mean, in Canada, I was just talking to a journalist about this about an hour ago. There were like there was nobody, nobody yeah. but me. And I was, you know, people in Canada didn't even know what the media didn't know what to make of me because I was an anomaly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they were like, is this a is this a genre of music we even take seriously? Uh, number one. Number two, she's a girl and she looks pretty good. So virtue of the fact that she's attractive, should we even give her any credibility? There was sort of the, a lot of um, uh, double standards Man. back then. Um, so there was a little bit, definitely, I wouldn't say a little bit of an uphill battle to climb, but a big uphill battle to climb in terms of clawing my way to a place of respectability and credibility because that whole, you know, genre and the whole culture of that genre was to market you like a sex kitten. Right. That was kind of the vibe. Right. And, you know, metal queen, the song and the album, it was quite a feminine, quite a feminist message that I was trying to put out at that time. And the reality is it just kind of got lost. I mean, most 14 year old, 15 year old boys didn't get that, but a lot of the right. interviews that I do nowadays, um, you know, in ref in retrospect, people look back and they go, man, yeah, you were really like trying to blaze a path for women. But mm -hmm. it kind of got lost in the culture of that hard rock yeah. genre, that era. Um, so I think, you know, certainly nowadays I've sort of like earned a, a platform of respectability, but it was it was a bit of a bit of an uphill battle back then um but were they fun times oh yeah hell yeah, yeah good good that's that's yeah. good you know uh you know because i mean that it's a change you know and it's like you say it had to be rough uh for you in in many ways so uh you know it's good that you you got to enjoy the the perks of it for sure uh do you feel like it still stands up the music You know, it's interesting. You, you, no one's ever asked that me that question. Um, I think the song writing values absolutely stand up. Um, sometimes I struggle going back and listening to those albums because I think all of those albums from the the, the early to mid eight, to late eighties are kind of riddled with very very eighties production values. You know that sort of the right. Death Bird snare and the, the <laughs> tough, it's way too much. You know ambience on everything right? right um whereas a lot of you know the, you go back and you listen to rolling stones records from those eras they don't they're not 
fraught with that 80s those 80s production values in the same way so they they tend to stand up in a little more of a timeless way but certainly the the um the songwriting stands tall and i know that i get so many um positive uh uh, comments and feedback from fans that just you know they go back to that and they go they like you know this song or that song or tough girls don't cry for you know body rock it just it got me through such a tough time and um the fact that the songwriting values stand up and still resonate with people that's really that's really meaningful to me yeah i i know it is because you you write your own stuff you you make yeah. it a point to do that uh you've had other writers in um you know great writers uh you know we're talking joel and turner and rick Emmett on the first record and uh you know uh, uh, bob ezrin producing and dick wagner and just so many great writers and producers and names uh that are just great in the industry um but writing your own stuff's very important to you isn't it Well, yeah, I, um, well, you know, with that said, it's not, I'm not above, uh, recording a cover tune. If I, if it works for me and I, it's something that I want to do, like on some girls do, we recorded, uh, tell me something good by Chaka Khan, which Mm -hmm. was kind of like rock funk. And, um, recently on the diamond baby blues album, I recorded, um, a few covers I did, a cover of Black Edgemont Jackson's Black Cat, and I did You're No Good, Linda Ronstad sort of version. Um, but, you know, I got into music uh, as a youngster because it was a cathartic outlet for me um, and a place for me to put my, my thoughts and feelings. And I started out um, when I was younger. I, I, many people don't know this, but I won poetry contests in school. and. I was I was writing poetry all throughout my youth in high school, and uh, so yeah, it's always been important. The songwriting aspect of it has always been really important to me, and um, the whole just the whole process of creation. It's that's who I am, and uh, I, I I wouldn't be satisfied consistently making cover records. No. Yeah. 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 Um, 2006 to 2016 you kind of took a leave of absence right and uh, okay. built a built a family uh your tomboy is now 17 years old something like that right just turned 18 holy it's, smokes eh? wow it's pretty cool oh, yeah um do you feel like that experience uh that time away changed your approach to music a little bit or did you just pick up where you left off uh my approach to music well um yeah i think it helped me more fully define what i absolutely wanted to do you know when you're younger you're kind of trying to figure yourself out and um even though i had major record deals in the past i felt like i was always kind of meandering through um i knew i knew stylistically what i wanted to do but you know just fi- you know figuring out the things that were important to me and what I wanted to write about. It's a lot easier now because children just turn your life inside out and put <laughs> everything in. You got to line up all your ducks and get everything in perspective. It changes your entire worldview. I certainly know what my pro- priorities are and what's important to me now. And it also, you know, once you have children, the luxury of dilly dallying around in my studio all day, just taking my sweet time to it was like when my kids were little and I had song ideas, I would be locking myself in the bathroom for five minutes, <laughs> blah, 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 and try to record something into my iPhone. And they're like, Mom, and they're napping, and I'm just going, just be quiet for five, seven minutes. I'm just going to record this idea, you know. And so I realized I had to work. Um, uh, harder and a lot harder in a lot more condensed amount of time. So I think it really helped me figure out, streamline what I wanted to do okay. for sure did, musically. Yeah. Did you did you ever <laughs> consider not returning? You know, sitting in a cubicle. I uh, you know is that was that ever did it ever did you ever say, you know, maybe I should just get a regular job. 
Well, it's interesting that you asked that as well, because when our when my son was extremely little, he's 16 now, uh, it was really apparent early on that he was having, he's extremely brilliant, but he's, I guess they call it gifted, sort of, and he had some learning challenges because he couldn't learn in conventional ways. So I actually went back to college for a little while and got a degree in special education to be able to help him. Um, and if I found it fascinating. This is in that 12 year hiatus that I took from writing and recording. Um, and I put a lot of my creative energies into that. And I actually worked with the local, the local school district on some learning support teams, putting together programs for children to try to understand how gifted killed children think and how I could better help my son, if that makes sense. And uh, so that was a great period of exploration for me, although I never considered walking away from music. In fact, sometimes seeing sort of how the real world operates and how that those kind of systems work, it made me more than ever go, oh my gosh, I have to make another record. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> I, don't, I could never ever fully do nine to five, I don't think. Not to criticize that because I, I have so much respect right. for people that make that work for their life, but um, yeah, you know, so, um, but that experience as an educator for a while uh, w was a wonderful one. Um, awesome. But yeah, it, it was just almost re-energized me to want to be creative again and to continue to make music. That's yeah. very cool. Very cool. I, I, well, let's talk about Elevate, uh, new music. Uh, incredible new music. I can't stop listening to it. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> It's so good. Uh, but the first thing that struck me I when I put it on, Mike Fraser's all over this record, uh, right? I mean, he engineered this record. It's got that ACDC kind of... Rhythm. Those beautiful sounds. It's just I that tell you. rhythm oh, riffing I thing. It's so cool. How, you know, tell me, tell me about that. Tell me about that sound and, and how you get that. Well, Mike worked with us on Radio One as well, mm -hmm. although he did not record those bed tracks with us. They were engineered by somebody different. Um, and But he did step in for the mix process. That's how I ended up meeting Mike. Um, I was looking for a, a mixer to mix Radio One, and um, we connected that way, and uh, we were kind of like, why have we never worked together before? <laughs> because we just got on like a brother and a, a brother and sister. It was awesome. it was great. Um, and then so we fully decided after that experience, we're like, you have to come in and engineer the recording process for the next album as well. And so Mike, he basically just rolled in all his wizard amps and his wizard heads. And Sean Kelly, my guitar player, was in seventh heaven recording this album because that's it's just it's magic mike i don't even know what to say he's just he's got those are his signature sounds and we wanted those on this album um so you know mike wasn't really involved in the in the um you know the production process of uh you know song arranging and all that that was myself and right. the band we did that ourselves but those sounds those are so uniquely mike and um we are just so happy to have them. It's, um, of course, he tweaks everything to suit the artist in the end. So we worked sure. on all those mixes together. But uh, yeah, it's just such a blessing working with him. He's amazing. It, it's just a great sounding record. And, uh, you know, what was the intention going into this record? Did you say, I want an ACDC type of, you know, that rhythm pop thing or, uh, you know, that big sound? Or, you know, do you want a melting pot? Did, did you have any specific intention making the record or were you just writing and it turned out the way it turned out? Yeah, you know, I don't usually go into an original album with us like a, a theme or an idea. Of course, we wanted the sounds. We wanted, obviously, the to have that big, fat Mike Fraser sound. Yeah. But uh, the writing process, you know, we just... We just continued 
to bounce ideas back and forth because we were all stuck at home in COVID. Like things didn't really open up until the late spring of this year when we were uh, like, I, I got to tell you, a month before I went to Sweden Rock Festival, I was on the phone with my manager going, I'm nervous to book those tickets because we don't have a deposit and we've, we, and they were, they were, they were still insisting that you do COVID tests to come back into Canada. And we were waiting for them to eliminate that restriction so that we knew fully that we could go to Sweden and come back without fear of being stuck at the Copenhagen airport for two weeks. You know? <laughs> right, really? It was, it was scary in that, in the late spring. And it's, it's funny how quickly we forget here we are in October and it feels like COVID never happened almost. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Right. It but is. I remember the anxiety that I was feeling um, back then about, about coming back. And um, so, uh, you know, obviously we were able to tour this summer, but the previous mm -hmm. year we were literally stuck at home again. So Elevate is our COVID baby. You know, we, oh. I think our only intention was just let's continue writing great songs and without putting too many filters on ourselves. So the album, you know, unlike ACDC, we don't, we don't have a sort of a samey sound for every single song. Not that that's a bad thing. It's their signature sound, but right. the albums that I make, they're a little more like a Fleetwood Mac record or a, Mm -hmm. Bowie record where they take you or even a Zeppelin record they kind of take you on a like a journey and some of the songs they sound like the same singer and the same players but they have a different mood if yes. that makes sense so entirely and that's what you know I, I want the whole album to be like a listening experience for the listener and it is it is so you know you get like it starts off with that rock bottom revolution it's got that big acdc heavier sound and then it gets to a almost like an avril lavigne kind of pop fun bouncy thing and then we get probably my favorite song on the record which is very odd because i'm you know i, lo I love all music but i'm a i'm a hard rock guy you know it was all over metal queen you know what i mean so <laughs> the song i continue to go back to and i just fall in love with every single time is red dress uh mm -hmm. it's gorgeous it's just so it puts me like you say you, you go to a different place it just puts me in a place that's just so warm and comfortable and i you know, almost get tears just talking about it it's just so sweet um Tell me about the song. Uh, you know, 60 bucks, the brother's old beat up car. Is that all, you know, who is it for? I'm going to ask, um, you know, and is that all part of, you know, art school? Is it, all, is it all true or is it a fictional thing? Let me, um, yeah, try to talk about that song. Um, it, it's uh it is true um but it's not about one relationship it, it's about two okay. um let me try to explain that my i've been married for over 20 20 years now and you know happily married got kids and everything and yep. my husband but my husband and i it's our second marriage for both of us we were both married a long time ago when we were young and we always we, we joke around and we go you know in a perfect world wouldn't it have been nice to have stayed with our first partners? And of course we would have never met, but you know, you, you know, just in a perfect world, you know, you see that old couple they've been married 50 years and yep. don't you wish that, you know, hopefully, <laughs> <Almost there. laughs> yeah, well, you know, but that's not us. It's a, you know, we, we, right. we made our mistakes and luckily God is a God of second chances and here we are. But, um, and then, what happened during COVID is my my former husband, the gentleman I married when I was very young, and obviously it, he passed away from COVID. So that was heartbreaking. It, it was devastating and heartbreaking, and that's kind of what inspired the song. So that first pair, that first verse of the song, is about my first marriage. I had just he had just come out of art school, and I was going to be a rock star, and we loved Prince went and saw him yeah. but then the second verse is about my current life ah, but then yeah. the song is supposed to be about what if what if 
it was just something that lasted forever. Uh, so that's think, just it's it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it just the story too. Uh, it just it it doesn't surprise me because I feel that when I listen to it. It it's I feel that sensitivity uh, to that song. There's something with that song that just touches me. Well, I wrote it on piano, and then I'm like, Sean Kelly, get some rock guitars in here, buddy. <laughs> so we had to power ballad out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. it it's just, yeah, it's so well, sweet. You. It's so great. Um, if I could only play one song for for somebody introducing them to Lee Aaron, uh, what, what should be the first thing I play for them? Of all my records of all time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you, what would you, what would you, what do you want as your first impression for somebody that, you know, wants to experience your, your voice, your music? Well, I can tell you a song that I've just recently fallen in love with uh, again, and it's off Radio One, and we've started playing it live, and it just, people are singing it by the end of the song, even if they've ever, never heard it, is Soul Breaker. Okay. Soul Breaker from Radio On. Yeah. It to me, it just says everything about Learen. It's soulful. It's it's tough. It's got a great rock and roll riff, and I get a chance to do my high, my high uh, power rock vocals. You know, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That would be a great thing. Uh, now I know you. Know, we, uh, you've talked about the autobiography. It's coming. Um, it's almost ready, from what I hear. Uh, is was there anything you were apprehensive about with you know exposure like you know that your kids would read? Is there anything you know that you just kind of went a little bit embarrassing, a little bit, but it's your life. Um, you know, things in the past. Um was there anything there that you were apprehensive about putting into a uh, text? <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not ready yet i'll tell you that right now i've been um one of the other things that sidelined me a little bit during covid is my husband and i had to move um we were our former property was engulfed by development and we were forced to sell and buy a new house and that was just quite a process and i kind of had to put the book on a shelf for so it's about half done right now okay. and i'm still working through it uh, my husband is actually a wonderful writer as well um and he always says to me, it's not worth writing unless it's brutally honest. Mm -hmm. And so I have struggled a little bit with that because, yeah, like airing all your dirty laundry. But, yeah. you know, when you think about the books that get made into movies and things like that, you've got to you've got to dig deep or it's not it's not a story worth telling. So um what it, what I can tell you what my my uh, memoirs are, will not be is just a chronological uh, recap of my career. Um, I, you know, the first few chapters of the book just talk about my childhood because my childhood was interesting, and that's all I'm going to tell you. But uh -huh. you know, I think a lot of what we grow up in the environments we grow up in and what we uh, experience as children in, in our familial homes informs our art big time right and uh and so yeah i mean i i had to really start looking at all that stuff because all of that stuff brought me to places where i made certain choices when i was young and which all led me down the the path to where i am now right so right right yeah, yeah it's your life journey and uh you know i'm excited to uh to read it uh i know you're you're, you're you've got to go you've got a full, full day here i got one more for you uh, something you've always wanted to do um, in your life and you just haven't had the chance to do it yet. You've done so much with your life and you continue to do things uh, and different things. You know, you've you've sung jazz and blues and you've done some pop stuff and you've done the metal stuff uh, in musically and, and personally. Uh, is there anything you've always wanted to do uh, that you haven't had a chance yet? Well, interesting that you ask, because uh, I have played in uh, France multiple times throughout my career. And in fact, the end of this month, we're going back and we're doing a festival in France. 
And even though I have been in and out of Paris multiple times, I've never been able to spend time in Paris and go to the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower. And this time on October 29th, I'm playing there and my I we booked five extra days. I'm staying in Paris for five days. Nice. <laughs> ah, that's great. The Louvre and the Eiffel Tower and the castle at Versailles. And I'm doing that. So that was a bit of a lifelong dream was just to hang out in Paris. Yeah. Um, but one of the other things I'd, I'd love to vacation in Greece, just to travel. I lo I'd love to travel for pleasure because I've done so much traveling in my life and not a lot of it has been for pleasure. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, and you know, that's, you know, I've, I've, I, I just was on, on the road kind of in the Midwest here with, as a photographer um, with a band and, you know, I see them play. They come out, they play, then they do their thing, and then they move on. Then the next day, they drive for as many hours as they need to to get to the next place. They don't really have time to – it doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? It can be Indiana. It can be Paris. If you're playing a show and you got somewhere to be the next day, you're not going to see that much. It's it, You know, their time was taken. I, they were you, done. You meet, you meet a few fans at the autograph table. If you do that, you mm -hmm. see the inside of a tour bus, hotels, radio stations sometimes, and the inside of a venue. And yep. it starts to become a blur. Um, back in the day, my road crew used to have to tape the name of the city on the front of my monitor because I'd be going, you know, right. and embarrassingly this summer, I was playing a big festival in Kitchener, Ontario, and I said Kingston. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, kick my butt. You know, I, I felt uh, so embarrassed. Because <laughs> I was going to visit my family in Kingston the next day, and I was, anyway, and I'm going, age old, it's hard to break, you know, bad rock and roll habits, and this is one of them, saying the wrong city name. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it is a blur. Yeah, I mean, it gets yeah, to be totally. you know, yeah. it's just another room, no matter where it is. So it's nice that you're going to get that chance to uh, to experience Paris. Probably been there a million times and just has I have never seen it. So <laughs> I, have, I have been there multiple times. And I remember the one time I was there and I'm like, I got a day off. And they're like, oh, sorry, Lee, the Louvre is actually closed on Thursdays <laughs> or whatever day it was. It's closed one day of the week. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Murphy's Law. So, yeah, <laughs> I am going to see the Mona Lisa. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. I'm happy for you, for sure. Uh, right. Well, Lee, I am going to let you go. I know you got a full day, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Lee Aaron playing in France on October 29th. And she'll be enjoying France after that. And then uh, you have the Monsters of Rock Cruise in early 2023. That is exciting. That's very cool. Um, your new album, Elevate, comes out November 25th. People need to hear this record. Metalville Records. Uh, LeeAaron.com for all the info. Absolute honor. Thank you so much. Talking to you, Scott. And I, I look forward to talking to you next time. Absolutely. That would be great. Okay. <laughs> right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. God bless. Bye.